See, this is my daily prayer. I pray this in my prayers daily for speaking with them. And we've heard it all the week that we would be on one accord, one mind, one spirit, speaking the same thing, that we might come into the unity of the faith and that we may be a true representative of Jesus Christ in a true fellowship. And so we're seeing these things come to pass. And God is not a respected person. God has put this thing together. We wanted to share and share the blessings of the Lord that's upon our lives with people just because we know that if they would take it and receive it and follow, they could be blessed the same way. So I'm going to be talking from a different standpoint of unity, but yet I want it to be, it'll still be unity. I want you to concentrate on unity in your personal lives, that we'll all be saying the same thing. And what I mean by unity, unity in line with the Word of God. If you do that, see, you'll experience wonderful, wonderful blessings in your life. Because so many, you know, want the blessings in the ministry. The minister wants a big church. He wants to be blessed financially. He wants all the blessings of God, but sometimes they forget about their families. And so I'm going to be speaking from the subject, blameless in ministry. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's some warnings I want to throw out because there are many that started out with us. They're not here today because they are not in unity in all the things that we do. <laughs> you want to be unity in a holy life. You want to be unity in doing the things that uh, Jesus told us not to do. We want to be in unity that way. So let's begin at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1. It says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. You see, God's telling you this is a good work. You desire that. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Now, blameless does not mean perfect, but one against whom no evil can be proved. See, we're not perfect, so we might make mistakes. But we shouldn't deliberately do stuff. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, not wives on, women on the side, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Apparently, a lot of ministers don't read this part. They want to know about faith. How do I get a house? How do I get a car? How do I get clothes? How do I get shoes? How about how to take care of your wife? And wife, how about taking care of your husband? We need to learn use our faith for those types of things. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. I'm going to read the scriptures, then I'll come back in. Beginning at verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. This is the Apostle Paul talking to Titus. You should set in order the things that are lacking. And appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So I believe these are some things 
laid out for our leaders, pastors and men in ministry and women in ministry. So I'm going to go through a few of these because there's no way I could go through all of it. But I want to, I want to uh, settle down on a couple of things, and I'll, I'll let you know as I go along. Number one, husband of one wife. Like I said before, <laughs> did not say and woman on the side. All women on the side. <laughs> and there's too much careless living among ministers of the gospel, and it is. My heart grieves. I get... I shouldn't say tons. I get many, many calls from pastors' wives all over the country telling me about how their husbands are treating them. I don't know how in the world they think they're going to please God or be blessed of God. If you do, it's just going to be temporary blessing. It's not going to be something that's lasting. So the pastor should be a faithful husband. Now, Ephesians 5.25, I won't go to it, but it, it tells the husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And then it tells the wives to reverence their husbands. I'm just, and you can read that on your own because I know all of you know where that script is in Ephesians, uh, the fifth chapter. And so there are numerous pastors guilty of infidelity. Now, in order to stay out of that, you should make rules for yourself as a pastor. And we don't hear that much about women. Sometimes women get into it, but if they are, they can apply it. But I'm talking so much about so many pastors that I know of and heard of and minister. But in order to keep yourself out of trouble, you should make rules for yourself. You should have your wife help you in ministry. So many men, they don't want their wives to help them. They act like their wives are something out there and the minister is something over here. If you had your wife to, to be a part of what you do, then you would be so prone to be open to listening to the other sisters or the organist or the secretary and get yourself in trouble. <laughs> so you are some so-called spiritual sister. Uh, let's turn to Job chapter 31. Too many people do this, and oh, it breaks my heart. Plus, like I said, you love God. You want to obey God. It was quoted earlier, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them. That's one of his commandments. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Uh, Job 31. And I love this. Now, Job... He wasn't even born again. But he made some wonderful statements of wisdom which we as leaders could learn from. Let's listen to uh, Job 31, beginning at verse 1. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Oh, I love it. <laughs> if we made covenants with our eyes, we wouldn't be in trouble. <laughs> I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above? And the inheritance of Almighty from on high, is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not say my steps? Does he not see my steps and count? Oh, does he not see my ways and count all my steps? So God sees it. Do we really know that God is real and that he's in our lives and that he's with us, whatever we're doing? Apparently, we're not, we don't realize that in Job, but this is, a, this is the old covenant, and he knew that. Verse 4 says, Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? You know, God is with you when you doing stuff you don't have any business. Your wife should not have to get in a verbal or physical fight with any other woman of the church. I heard stories like that. Because of your indiscretion. She should not have to lower herself to that level as a Christian woman. Do you know what you do to your wives? They have such poor self-esteem when you don't treat them like you should. And so and then you look over them and, and, and uh, you're in a position where you're surrounded by women because women love pastors. But you need to know, I can't have all those women, so make some rules for yourself. <laughs> because it's going to be one after another. I mean, I talked to a lady who said, she told me at 20 years, her husband had been running around with women, one after another. And she said she didn't know it. She's very naive, though. How could you know your husband's not doing something? Anyway, but he caught up with him, and then we'll catch up with any of you. As young ministers learn this, because the temptations are going to come. But she said that he had been running around for like 20 years, and the only way she finally found out was that he got sick. Sick catches up with you. And so he ended up having to tell her. So then she called me and wanted to ask me what should she do. I said, well, 
you have a you have a biblical reason to leave your husband when he's you know uh, in adultery, but that's not always the, the, that's not always the reason why you should leave him because you maybe should talk about it and be able to come together, uh, you know, on a on a point where you can agree and if he's changed. But the thing about it, if you do stay, you're going to have to really forgive him. I mean, really forgive him. And you can't be remembering all this stuff because otherwise if you're going to be worried and be stressed out, then you're causing sickness to come in your body and your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you have to think about all those things uh, that's involved when you are, get involved in a situation like that to make the right decision. That's going to be the, a blessing to yourself and to the body of Christ. So if you decide to stay, then you have to stay uh, knowing that you can't hold anything against him. And so you would have to work that out personally. But it's too much of that going on. And apparently, like I said, people don't make rules for themselves. And as a leader, you're going to be approached by women. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish it was just that easy. But the Bible tells you what to do. You don't have to yield to the temptations and things that come to you. And he'll, the devil will try anyway, especially if you are going to be a big ministry. See, you don't know what's out there for you. The devil doesn't know what's out there for you. God already knows. So God's not testing you, but the devil will test you. And the devil will bring all kinds of temptation in front of you. And if you've got it made as far as you're not going to get physically involved with somebody, somebody, the devil will try to get in through another door. Now, I've told this story before, and my husband already knows about it. He doesn't care about us sharing. But we share whatever we need to share to help you, to help us come into this oneness. Because if you want to really come into the unity, you, have, you can learn from us in this way so that you will have a clean, pure life before God. And so in our early ministry, when um, the ministry was just beginning to take off and we had got spirit filled and we were just all so excited and so many things were happening and, and uh, we had gone through all of our hard times where I really knew how to be the wife that I should be. I knew how not to withhold my body from my husband. I knew all of this. So I knew he's not interested in anybody as far as getting involved sexually. But then the devil tried to get at him another way because we had just gotten spirit filled hungry for the things of the Spirit, you know, wanted to know God. Anybody that said they had something from God or a word from God or at that time was really interested if, you know, if they said that's God, you know. And so uh, the devil just, I believe it's the devil. And I don't know, God used it though. This woman came and she was a person that was so spiritual. And that's what you have to be careful about, man. Sometimes women come into the church and you've been with your wife and your wife has worked with you and got you to this point. And then this, then you think you're moving into another level where the spiritual sister comes in and then you don't have anything in common with your wife anymore. And I've seen a, a, a couple that used to come to us regularly and this happened to them. I mean, this guy just totally left his wife because this woman was the one that had things in the spirit with him, so he thought. So the devil can trick you that way where you can think, well, I don't want her in, in the flesh as far as that's concerned. But then you get your soul mind all messed up listening to this person mesmerize you with all of her stories about what God's going to do. And so this is what this woman was doing. She was coming and she was just, you know, telling him stuff all the time. And I mean, she was, every time a, a service was over, she was right there in front of him. Nobody else could talk to him. She was talking to him. And she finally got her telephone number and she started calling. And I, see, I know myself and I don't have any jealousy in me, but that was a little inordinate. Inordinate. <laughs> it was inordinate. It was beyond, you know, regular Christian love. And so, <laughs> what love? And my husband, he couldn't see it at the time because he knows I don't want to be involved with somebody uh, sexually, but she's going to get him another way. She, and, and so sometimes when, and then because I could see it and then we would be at odds because I would be telling him about it and then he would get upset with me. So the enemy could squeeze something in before you know it because he'd be upset with me. Then he could run over to talk to her and before you know it, somebody take a picture of something. You, the, the Bible says to avoid the very appearance of evil because she would tell him stuff and it was. It, it probably sound interesting. And when the thing about it, she came to him in a way like, well, you know, I don't have anybody to talk to. I need somebody spiritually to talk to and I, and I need you, you know, telling him. So he was thinking, feeling he obligated. I have to help this woman in ministry. No, you don't. Anyway... <laughs> God is the one called to let God help her. <laughs> but anyway, she had all these stories, and they were wonderful stories. You know, she told this story. And see, it, I knew it wasn't God. I knew God was trying to trick him up. And this, she told him, uh, you know, I see myself as a first black Catherine Koopman. I see myself on the stage. God has shown me this. 
and Catherine Kuhlman has died and gone on to heaven, and that girl is not Catherine Kuhlman yet, and not even nothing like her. But she got all these stories that the devil was giving her to feed him, and that's the way he'll do to just try to get you off in another way. And he couldn't see it. He just couldn't see it because he thought, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, but this girl is feeding your mind with this, and you getting all intertwined in your soulish areas, all messed up emotionally because you want to hear these stories. And so it got so bad. I hate this story. I hate telling it, but I don't mind it now because I have been able to help hundreds of pastors' wives because there's so many that have passed that way. So finally, I, you know, talking to him, I couldn't get him to see it. And so finally, I just had to be strong. My husband told me, tell the women that. I had to just be strong and say, well, if you have to keep talking to her. You have to keep talking to this lady then I'm not going to church because we are not going to be people that ride to church and fuss all the way to church and then get out and smile and act like everything is all right. I'm not going to do that. I don't live like that. It's got to be true. And so anyway, I told him, well, if, you know, if you've got to have this relationship, I'm out of here. I'm not going to church with you another Sunday. And I did miss one Sunday one time. He said, if you wanted to hurt me, you really did hurt me because I did not go. And so I said, I'm not going unless this relationship changes. And he says, uh, well, what will you tell the people? I say, well, I'll just tell them. Do you have a relationship with this person? <laughs> that bothers me. And so if, if you can't change it, then I'm, I'm going to step aside because I knew it was leading to destruction. I knew it. I didn't know that God had all this, but Satan was trying to trap him just before the ministry took off. And I mean, she had this thing so going, she had her little cohort friends around helping her out. She had this girl to write him a, a, a prophecy saying, uh, my son, the time that you spend with so-and-so is of me. Just like I'm crazy. <laughs> I didn't buy none of that. And see, he's so innocent. He's just giving me all the notes. <laughs> I said, I don't care. I, I, you know, I, that's not God. And so then they start in on me, you know, telling him little stuff, saying, oh, maybe she's going through the change. I was 38 at that time. <laughs> but she's going through the change. I don't care what you call it. Call it jealousy. Call it going through the change. Call it whatever you want. Just stop it. I don't care because I know I'm not jealous. I know I'm not any of that stuff. So that's why the wives need to uh, have a relationship with Jesus Christ so that no matter what happens, you have Jesus Christ there. See, so many women, they won't stand up. Now, see, that was minor, but we learned from that. And see, from that time to this, that was over 30 years ago, like 32, 33 years ago, my husband thanks me for taking that stand because from that time on, because he wants to be right with God. If you want to be right, you can change. And I, even though he thought that was a good relationship, you know, like a spiritual relationship, no such thing. You don't need no spiritual relationship with no woman. <laughs> I'm sorry. And so from that day, from that time to this, we have had no problem. God was getting him prepared for this ministry, to pe prepared to be leaders because he needs leaders that he can count on, leaders that he can trust. trust. And so a lot of you facing much more diff uh, difficult situations than that. Now, that was bad, but some of you actually facing situations where your husband actually flirts with women. He gets involved with women. He has affairs with women. He has children on the side. That's not of God. And then the U.S. wives, you hide that stuff, and the end of it is not good because when you hide it, uh, the truth can't come out and you end up hurting a whole lot more people than if you would, if you know it in your spirit and come out and say, I'm going to tell somebody, or I'm not going to stay here in this kind of thing, so that it can be revealed and the person can get out of the way if they're not honoring God, because it's too much of that stuff that goes on. And so sometimes as a wife, you might think, well, you know, that's going to be embarrassing, or that's going to cause him not to have a job or a church, where well, he's not going to have it anyway in the long run, when you think about it, and so you need to not have all your trust in a man, if, I don't care if it's your husband or whoever it is, if they're doing wrong, you need to stand up for righteousness. You ought to love God more than you love a man. Now, I'm not saying don't love your husband, but you better stand up for right if you want to be a good example of Jesus Christ. And that's all I'm, that's all I'm about. I want to represent Jesus Christ. Not that I'm perfect. None of us are perfect, but we work on it. And we all have had temptations and trials and tests, things that we had to face that we had to say no to. And so you need to crucify that flesh. You need to do what uh, Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech, you brothers by the, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's going to hurt to do some of those things. That's where sacrifice hurts. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy 
and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or rational service. But be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. That's one way God said he can prove it. But you have to present your body and don't let your mind do like the world because that's what the world does. They believe in doing all that kind of stuff. And so many church people fall right into the same thing. And so if you don't, if you don't discipline your body, then it won't be disciplined. Now, number two, I'm going to hit on some more things, and I'll still be covering some more of that. He should be temperate. See, all of that has to do with uh, um, self-control and temperate and, and uh, watching your behavior. You should be temperate, sober-minded, and of good behavior. It's not good behavior. God would, Jesus wouldn't treat the church like some of the men treat their wives. He should not be having adulterous affairs on the side. And I know so many that have had adulterous affairs on the side. Some women have decided to stay, and some still messing around out there, thinking their church is going to make it. You out there and the wife know that the husband is having this affair and they're trying to keep the church running. It's not going to work. So you need to do it for God. <laughs> you can't do it for yourself. God will help you. And don't be so afraid that you're not going to be taken care of. God is your source. He's the one who will take care of you. You stand up there for stuff that's going on wrong because the end of it's not going to be good. So I, and I, I know tons. I know a minister now that just was having a woman after woman, even having children by these women, make his wife suffer like that. And the wife didn't have whatever it took to stand up and say, I'm not living like this. You don't have to live like that. God doesn't want you to be abused, misused, run over. He, you have a place there by side, right by the side of your husband, and he should honor that. And if, if any of you, and I don't know if any are in here, but any, you're not honoring your wife as you should and giving her her rightful place, because if you gave her the rightful place where she should be, then the women wouldn't be coming up trying to take you over. Now, they might still try to tempt you, because we've had a lot of it. You heard a lot of stories with me right here. I mean, I, but I don't care. See, I love women. That one incident didn't make me turn against women. I wouldn't run a church without women. I love women. <laughs> Come and help us do what God has called us to do. But you shouldn't get to the point where, if your husband, because the husband's going to be involved, where if he compliments a woman, don't be upset and jealous because he complimented this woman because she looks good. Women are going to be looking good and he's not dead. And so, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. As long as, you, long as you don't just compliment the other women and never compliment your wife. You shouldn't be trying to, you know, talk about all the women and you're not doing what you should to keep your wife looking good. So I don't mind him doing that because he looks after me. So I don't care. And I wouldn't want to run the church without women. But he's got a lot of women come in. If he hadn't have taken his stand, you wouldn't be here right now. The church started growing and the women come. There's a woman in our, used to come in our Tuesday night Bible study every night. And I'm, I'm very naive of heart. I mean, you have to tell me, you have to come right in front of me. The lady used to sit right across from me. And I would think, you know, and I knew she dressed kind of seductive, you know, if, Everything's showing part way. And I just said, well, she's just out of the world, so she'll learn. <laughs> she was there for a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> one, day, one, one day she made an appointment with him, came to his office. You've heard this story. And I know who the lady is, now. I didn't know it then. He didn't tell me then. But anyway, uh, she came to his office, and she was the one that what she wanted to see him, what, was to t what she wanted to see him for was to tell him, I want you. So thank God he made roof for himself and, and said maybe like he's always saying, and my body says, I want you, but my spirit says, no, open the door and let him out. And that's what you better do. So you have to be strong enough to do that, and you have to be strong enough in the Word to do that. I've had women, in one of my Bible studies, I used to teach a Bible study, and this woman came up to me. Now, she didn't get out of hand, but these women just have these things in their heads. That, and see, they're not in love with the man. Man is crazy to try to go fall for some woman that's after him. They're after the anointing. They love the anointing. And when the anointing is gone and they open up their eyes and see that flesh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I made a mistake. <laughs> so don't, don't think you got it going on, guys, so much. <laughs> because that's what they're after. They're after your anointing, see. Yeah. And then when they get you and get you all messed up, have no life left, I mean, I could tell you story after story thinking about a, a minister now had the largest church out here in the Bakersfield area. And that's some woman fooled him to lose that church, 6,000 members. And he left the largest church there. He left with this woman, and he ended up messed up the rest of his life. And once he left the church, the woman left him. 
That's what you need to think about. They're not gonna, they're not gonna hang around with you. And I understand he died a very lonely man. Another Methodist minister that left his wife for some other young woman, same thing happened. He ended up losing his church, and the woman left him, and he ended up a very lonely man. You can learn from these, young, these things, young ministers, because the temptation is going to come your way. Because the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, trials, and tests, knowing this is going to come when you fall in, not if you. You all will be faced with this, especially if you're doing something for God, and that's an area. So you have, to, you have to make rules for yourself and don't, oh, I, I wouldn't be responsible if I was a man. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be responsible for the death of my husband or the death of my wife because I didn't live right. And a lot of them they have, and the wives are not strong and they're not in the Word, so they don't really know how to fight it. So they end up getting sick. This other minister that I was telling you about that kept having affairs and having children on the side, his wife ended up sick. But of course he ended up dying early. So that's why you don't play with God. I don't believe in playing with God. And so you need to do, you know, that the kingdom of God, and I'm taking this out of context now, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. When I say meat and drink, you can take meat the other way. You don't need that other meat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Because I would not, <laughs> I would not want to be responsible. You think about how you're supposed to be the leader, and you can't even get your home in order. When you do that, then your children don't even know who God is. They're confused. I mean, my mother and father, I mean, our, you know, mothers and fathers are the first God that their children see. And if they don't see God in you, and I'm thinking about another person, I mean, if I had some of these people, you would know them. They left their wives, married real soon, and it just was so disgusting to their children. But the kids say, I don't ever want to see a church again. Oh, I wouldn't want that responsibility. I wouldn't want that on me. So think about it, ministers. You just make rules for yourself and know if I can't have all the women anyway, so may as well love my wife as the Bible says, as Christ loved the church. Use your faith. Spend time with God and go over that scripture. If you have a problem there, go over that scripture over and over again. I love my wife as Christ loves the church. Just do that until you get it down into your spirit, and then you're going to be happy later on. Okay, moving on. There should be no competition in ministry between husbands and wives. Now, sometimes husbands and wives, uh, if wives are called to the ministry, sometimes they compete, and then it end, ends up being... Uh, a mess, and so I've heard of cases where the wives have left and went on and started their own ministry. Well, God doesn't get any glory out of that, and then again, the children are confused. See, what, when I, what I stand for when I think about my children, the future generation that's going to carry on the work of God, I want to be an example for that. See, God has, we're the only ones, we're the only, uh, oh, what is that saying as much as I've said it? We're the only God that some people will see. So as my husband said this, and so if you look at your own life and you know what's going on in your own life, uh, can God count on you? Will the people see God in you? Can God trust you? So we are the people that God's counting on him. We are examples of Jesus Christ. And that's all I want to be. I, want, I, I like that better than, than, uh, you know, than anything in life. That's all, my purpose is just to please God. Uh, Romans 6, 11 says, I don't turn, you don't have to turn to it, but it says to reckon yourself to be dead. Count yourself to be dead. Act like you're dead. You know you're not dead, but he says to reckon yourself to be dead. So whatever's causing you problems, that thing that's causing you problems, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. So you have to act like that thing's cut off. It's causing you problems. <laughs> if I'm serious, just say if I didn't have it, I couldn't get in trouble. <laughs> It's dead, it's gone, I can't get in trouble. So, anyway, you really need to, I'm, it's comical, but it's the truth. You need to think about that. And again, I was talking about the women. You shouldn't be so jealous of your husband because he does compliment other women. There's some people that have so much jealousy and stuff in them for, for whatever reason. I don't, I don't even know why. But they, they, when their husbands compliment some woman or anyone, they, they turn against the woman. They're mad at the woman. The woman doesn't even know why you're mad at them. And uh, you end up not repenting of that because you don't want anybody to know you have this jealousy and envy and strife down inside of you. And that's how you can get up these ministers that 
can get up and preach the word, in fact, when they're not living right, or even women can preach the word, in fact, when they're not living right, it's because they, it's like a, it's like a, a actor, an actor or an actress. They can learn the mechanics of how to do it. I mean, you, uh, Pastor Torrance was, Dr. Torrance was telling us the other day how he, they, they learn that. They practice how to hoop so they can put on this performance. And see, they can do that. And they can draw people for a while, but there's no anointing on that. So, see, you can learn to do that, but you won't, you won't get the results that you really want and that you should get because that's not God. You have learned to do that, and there's no, no, there's no benefit in that. I think I want to say another point, but I'm trying to talk so, so fast, but maybe that will come back to me. But, miss, uh, but don't be greedy for money. Misuse their ministry to con. And I've heard a lot of people do that. Women in ministry, missionaries, and all kinds of folks. Con. I call it con, scheme, connive, deceive, extort. I call it spiritual prostitution. You do stuff to say stuff you have ability to perform, and then you know how to put a request out there, and people will just be given to you, and it's for your own greed. And so you need to not do that, and you need to be aware of that. And when someone is asking for churches and ministers to give to them, you need, we always do that, but you need to look behind who we're giving to and, 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 uh, and uh, their background and what, what they have accomplished. Because sometimes, I mean, we've been taken by a lot of people because we didn't know everything, and everybody is, they're, they're, uh, they're not, they're looking for something for themselves. They want to do something because it sounds good to be in Africa, to be here, or to be there, and I help here and help there. And we've given money to ministries, and sometimes I think we made mistakes because you haven't thought about who you were giving to. So you can't, when the Bible says give, and I love giving, that's one of my things. I believe I, God has laid it up on my heart to help and give. That's the basic thing that I love to do. But you have to think about who you give to. Now, we were given to an organization here all the time, and they weren't right helping the, the hungry, we thought. We wanted to do it because we wanted to help somebody. And I wanted to be in, I want to be with somebody who I, you know, we can't go out there and do it, so let's join an organization that can do it. And they were just taking advantage of us, not living the life, not doing right. So we found out and, and we had to stop doing it. So you have to be careful who you give to, not just give to a need, but find out what's behind that need. And because God certainly wants you to give, because over and over he says to give to the poor. And I am for that and to help the missions and to help ministries, but you better know who you're helping. You don't just help everybody. I told this ugly story, I think, in the women's convention about these little girls that were going to college down in San Diego, and then they left to go to Tijuana, and they stopped on the side of the road, and they saw this little um, dog, so they thought. And they picked this dog up. The dog was hurt and uh, in pain and bleeding, and so they picked this little dog up and took him back to their apartment, and washed him up and then put him in the bed with them. And come to find out, they took him to a, a, the animal doctor, the vet. They took him to, to the vet and found out that this was not a little cute doggy, but this was a Mexican rat that was full of rabies. So that's why you better be careful who you give to. You better know who you're giving to. They didn't know who that was, so they ended up being infected and messed up. So you think about that. I believe in giving because we give, but you better check behind who you're giving and check behind the performances and all the things that people can say to come up with why they need money. Okay. Another thing, this is number four, not covetous. I want to hit on that. And covetous means that is an insatiable desire for gain. That, that could be gain for power, position, control, as well as money. So you don't want to be a covetous person because there are a lot in the ministry that's that. They want the power. I mean, I don't want the power. Even if I don't have the money, I don't want to be in control. I want the position. You have people in your church. They want position. They don't care. Give me a position. Give me power. And uh, so they want, to be, they want to be the greatest. They want to be the biggest. They want to be this. They want to be that. And they don't want anybody else to come along and, and uh, be blessed. I know a minister that has just has the biggest problem with young ministers being blessed. Now, he would just have had a fit to hear Pastor Freeman last night talk about all that God has done for him in eight short years and took us 60 years to get there. <laughs> he, 
He ought to do it faster. You all ought to do it faster. We want you to do it faster. Why would we be jealous and envious and we, because we don't want anybody to get up here where we are? You can't stop God from blessing somebody. If they get the principles, they're going to be blessed. So why, do you, why are you trying to stop them? I love all of these sons in the ministry to be blessed. Because when they're blessed, I'm blessed. <laughs> and I love it. I love it. I mean, I, you can't stop God anyway. So why would you have ways like that? That they shouldn't have that. They haven't sacrificed long enough. They haven't lived long enough to have this kind of thing. Well, you can't tell God who to bless. You get in line with God's word, God's going to bless you. So that's the thing you have to think about. And not, you know, not get messed up because you don't want somebody to get up there where you are. No, pass me. Okay, another thing I want to hit on, one who rules his own house, his own house well. And of course, that's taking care of your children. But I'll just give you one scripture there. Look at Proverbs 20. Verse 7. It says, The righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. So if you will be an example for your children, that's one thing, why you, the reason why you want to do right and you want to get along as husband and wife because your children are watching. And like I say, they're the first God that your children see. If you will be an example before your children, you won't even be able to keep them from coming and, and helping you in ministry or from serving God. If they weren't helping you, they'd be doing something good. They'll, be, they'll stay in the kingdom of God. You couldn't run them away because they've seen the example in mother and dad that represents God to me. And that's what we've done with our children. We, we have, I mean, we live a life that's so open. You could follow us anywhere. You wouldn't catch us. You can follow us in the bedroom. You don't catch us doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing. So, so you should live a life like that. Where, because, number one, God sees everything you're doing anyway. So why don't you make up your mind? I want to do right. I want to do right by my children. I want to do right by my church. I'm not going to take advantage of uh, the spiritual sisters or the women that God has given to me. Because, number one, when you take advantage of them, you're defrauding them. And the Bible tells you to not defraud them. So you, can't, uh, you, you have to just watch your ways and watch what... Uh, God has told you to do. And his word tells you everything that you need to do to live this victorious, overcoming life. And you should be victorious, like I say, in your home as well as in the church. And uh, it, to me, it's just a disgrace before God that the, some of the stories that I have heard that men and women do in public and in their ministries that really affect the lives of people. See, that's what I would think about. Don't think about yourself so much, about what you want, what your flesh wants. That's why I know that you can get this word down. You can learn every single principle in your head. You can learn how to say it. You can learn how to preach it. You can learn how to demonstrate it. But it's not in your heart. Because if it was in your heart, you wouldn't treat your wife like that. You wouldn't have jealousies and envies against other people. And so I'm not talking about ministry. I'm talking about anything that you can get up and know the word, quote the word, and then you have all these issues in your life. The Word should take care of all the issues. So you're not submitted, you're not submitted to the Word of God. All you have is you have it in your head. And you never let it get down in your spirit. And you know why it can't get down in your spirit? Because you've never repented for the things that you've done. You've never said, I'm sorry that I treated this sister like this. I walked over this sister. I haven't even spoken to her because I was jealous because my husband said she was cute. And so you end up finding yourself sick later <laughs> because you got this junk inside of you. You learn the word in your head and you can get up and preach it, but it's never gotten down in your spirit. And it can't get in your spirit because you have all that other junk in there. There's no room for it. So you have to get that junk out of you so you can be a true representative of Jesus Christ. So the basis, oh, number six, seek no glory or, pra or praise of men for yourself. See, that's, you, you can be tempted to do that if you will allow yourself. But that's one thing I say about my husband. He don't care about no glory and no praise. All the things that we have ever done, we've done it to help people. We never went for money or anything. We went to crusades for years. We went across the United States in crusades. Never got a dime for it. I just want my people to know the word, to know they can get this truth. And the, the ministry would pay for him to go, but he never got a dime out of that. He just wanted our people to get set free. And look at a lot of you because of television. You're free now. And he did it to the glory of God. 
And so he wasn't seeking any praise for himself. And now as a result of that, we have sons all over this country who take care of us. And we don't have to we don't have to want for anything because every time we look up, we got money coming to us. We never asked for it. Got money coming from some sons we don't even know. They said, you, you've impacted my ministry. You're my mentor. You're my father in the ministry. And they just send money to us. We never had to ask for it. That's why I said you don't have to scheme and do all kinds of junk and deceive and connive to get money. God will do it. He says, blessed is the man that fears the Lord. I love this. And see how they say. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord that has a reverence for the Lord that delighteth greatly in his commandments. The Bible says his seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. And that next verse says wealth and riches shall be in his house. It's automatic. You do what God says. The man that fears the Lord that delights greatly in his commandments. Let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. These are ones I want you to uh, focus on these. Well, I want to read from verse 1. It says, For you, and this is the Apostle Paul, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of faith in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God, who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as, as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. That's what you should think about as ministers, what you can do to help people and not use flattering words and words to, to get from people on that basis. Okay, the basis for continual ministry is continual commitment. You can't let up on that commitment. Is uh, Let me read that again because I had some more to add to that. The basis for continual ministry is continual commitment to character. If a leader falls from these ethical standards, he or she should accept removal from leadership until an appropriate season of rever of reverifying of ca character can be fulfilled. And that's what some ministers don't want to do. So they out there messing over God's people, still performing and using their talent to get people to come in and if there's no anointing on it. Because if you haven't taken time to be proven after you have just, you know, fallen into um, to um, not living right or falling into adultery or whatever, and you didn't take time to get that right, then you're just performing. And there's no, uh, there, there's no anointing on it. And people love to go see a show. <laughs> no big thing. But you can do it God's way, and you can decide to, sit a, get, to go to a true man of God and ask the man of God what you should do, and the man of God tells you what you should do, and you do it, living proof, God will raise you up. And you, get, you get forgiveness out of you, you know, you ask God to forgive you and God forgives you, but it takes time to be proven in ministry so that you can even prove to yourself I can stand. But if you just keep on going after you've been into all this stuff and doing stuff you don't have any business, then, and I'll show you later when I get down what that'll do to you, but you can do what's right and God will raise you up and you will just feel so good because you're so clean inside. You see, God washes you by the washing of water by the word. He says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So no, we don't shoot our soldiers like they say in the, in the church that we shoot them. No, we don't. We just tell you to get off the battlefield until you get it together and then you come back. Otherwise, you're going to hurt a whole bunch of other people. So uh, 
also think about that if you if you have fallen or or know others that have fallen and they don't they don't take time then they they're messing over their lives. It takes time to uh, get your life back together. Let's look at First Timothy chapter four. Beginning at verse twelve. It says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, the way you live, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who will hear you. So keep these scriptures ministers and meditate on these. Now the word of God should be thoroughly fastened in our hearts. Listen to this. Should be thoroughly fastened in our hearts and mind concerning our ministry. And we must give our time and attention to its commandments. Because if you don't, you just do the same old thing. You just go out of, you know, move out of what you know in your head and you're just up there performing. Matters of importance do not come automatically. See, a lot of people, they stray from the Word. They say, well, I know it. I can get up and do that. So they don't spend their time in the Word, as uh, Pastor Dilla said, worshiping. It's one of the things I believe is the key to my husband's success. He doesn't play with the Word. He get up daily, hour and a half every day. That's the first thing he does. Pray in the Spirit and then pray in the understanding, but mostly in the Spirit. Keep your spirit strong, because if your spirit's not strong, then your soul and your body is going to take over. So it says, uh, matters of importance do not come automatically. The personal life of God's ministers ought to be as pure as their doctrine. A doctrine is your teaching. It should be as pure as your doctrine or teaching. If the servant of the Lord does not take heed to himself, his ministry will be just mere performance and acting with no anointing, which I've already said. God's influence can depart. Oh, this is so important. Listen to this. God's influence can depart from the human heart through carelessness. And our minds can lose the intensity of his call. I wouldn't want that to be me. But you can be careless and don't take heed to the word of God and go and do what your body is telling you and what your mind is telling you. And then you end up messed up. So let's look at Hebrews. In fact, uh, Pastor Freeman, I wrote this one down last night when he was speaking. Hebrews chapter 2. To see that it will lead you if you don't continue. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So we need to be careful and take heed and lest, lest uh, the word drift away from us. And that can happen. That's how people get into sin. They stop spending time in the word and they stop praying in the spirit and keeping their spirit man strong. Then when temptation comes, they just go down to the level of the temptation because their spirit's not strong enough to fight it off. You only go, go with what your mind says and what your body says. And that's a sad state. Uh, look at First Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, verses 12 and 13. Uh, I'll read from verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our ways to you. This is the Apostle Paul. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. That's still unity he's talking about it. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And this is my prayer for you. Now look at First Thessalonians chapter 4. Oh, we're right there. Begin at verse 1. 
Finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you walk from how, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So we need to, if you have problems there, you just need to get in the Word and read that over and over again until you get it down into your spirit. It said abstain. So if you're not doing that, you're not, you don't love God. Because he said, he that loveth me and keepeth my commandments, he it is that loveth me. So you need to abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. You should know how to do that. You can start that by making rules for yourself. I'm not going to get outside of where I should with women. I'll have my wife there. I'll do whatever. Whatever it takes to keep you on guard. Uh, number five, not in possession, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarn you and testify. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So when you think about messing over people's lives, you're out of, out of the word of God, having affairs with somebody else, you're defrauding that person and you're messing them up, as well as yourself, as well as your wife, as well as maybe a co-congregation. Uh, look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. So I want to leave this one with you. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to say to you as pastors and ministers of the gospel that you can live this type of life. We have lived this life all of these years. You don't have to fall into these temptations, trials, or tests. We've been in this ministry now for 32 years and that's why you never see a scandal on Pastor Price. You never see any of that. He comes out in the open to say how he feels about stuff. We don't go through these fist fights and stuff and, like I say, at home and then leave and fuss all the way to church and then get out and smile before the people. You need to be real. Your life needs to be real. And people can tell it, see. So you can work on that. You can be blameless in your ministry. And so I love you. I trust that this has been a blessing to you. And God bless you.